30th episode of Black Dance Stories and a new month of Black Dance Artists. And look at all the creatives on your screen. Ain't we just beautiful? Here's a note about why we are here. Our dance world was pummeled by COVID-19 and Black dance artists are finding ways to talk about life during this time. Our world was further turned upside down after horrible events ensued nationally and globally, bringing attention yet again to the need for the Black Lives Matter movement. Black dance artists have not been quiet. Black dance artists have been doing the work. Black dance artists continue to make work. To stay involved, we hold these weekly impromptu discussions and tell stories, Black dance stories. This is one action and we will stay involved. We, all of us here, are a community working together to support, uphold, highlight, and celebrate Black creatives. Tonight is our 30th episode of what we hope will be many stories told in the artists' own voices. Tonight, it's Diane Walker and Gabri Krista's turn. Woo, woo. Please meet some of our BDS family. I will go first. I am Charmaine Warren. I am a Jamaican. I am the great granddaughter of Ida Boyd granddaughter of Solomon Golson and Ruby Chapman, and one of nine children by Theophilus Warren and my 95-year-old mother, Perlene Warren, who lives in Jamaica. I am a non-disabled Black woman. Now and forever, I promise to give homage to the Native people by acknowledging that I live on the stolen land of the indigenous Lenape people, now known as Montclair, New Jersey with my husband, photographer and graphic artist, Tony Turner. Our daughter, Ashe Turner, a black ballerina with locks is in her junior year at Boston Conservatory. I have locks that are braided and fall to my shoulders. I'm wearing a green long sleeve blouse and large beige, black and red earrings. Behind me are photos of our family, a large lamp, a plant and African masks. Happy Black Dance Stories Thursday, BDS family. Thank you all for sharing the love and keeping this energy going. We are because of each of you. I turn it over to Kimani. Thank you, Charmaine. Yes, you know, Gloria Grimes' words, delicious, delightful dancing night. The importance of acknowledging our familial and dance legacies is an essential tradition. And in keeping with the tradition, I recognize my indigenous brothers and sisters as a first step in moving toward action. With profound respect, I honor and acknowledge the Lene Lenape, whose stolen land I am zooming from, currently known as the village of Harlem. I am a black non-disabled woman and I live with my 10-year-old son. I am sitting in my dining room. I have a golden hair, I have golden hair with close natural curls that frame my face. I am wearing a white and black long sleeve shirt. And I have a sterling silver hoop earring in one ear and a sterling silver black woman goddess's head in the other. I am the granddaughter of Lucille Madison, a wise and giving English professor. I teach because of her, daughter of Ronald Augustus Fowlin, Jamaican warrior and gourmet chef, and Anne Fowlin, rebel and Renaissance woman. I dance because of them. My son Tamayo keeps me present as I witness his growing boy. I am in awe of his amazing talents and his blossoming spirit. And with that, I turn it over to Makada. Thank you, Kimani. My name is Makada Lily in Wabunkozi, Margie Rose Roni. I am a part of Black Dance Stories as their on-camera producer. I am in this human experience as a non-disabled Black Indigenous American woman pronouns she, her, and I also identify with they in acknowledgement of my ancestors and my spirit team that's always around me, and that is also me. I come from a long generational line of artists and in energetic intuitives on both my maternal and paternal lines. I am the daughter of Mia Love and Antoine Roney, sister of Kojo Roney, Zipporah Roney, and Quasi Love, all of us beautiful, powerful artists. I acknowledge that I'm living on a part of the earth lands that was respectfully and harmoniously 
occupied by the Lenape, now known as Harlem, New York post-white settlership. I was also raised here. I am a life, body, soul alchemist in which I turn ethereal matter into what we call art, poetry, dance, and whatever else my soul is called to channel and express love, light, and truth. I am sitting in my loft room on a love seat. Behind me is a nice sunset and um, plants. I have my hair curl, natural curls and out flip to one side. I'm wearing a long sleeve shirt with, that's gray and white and black with buttons down the middle. And I turn it over to Mama Renee. <laughs> Thank you, my love. Good evening, everybody. I'm Renee Redding Jones, and I am Director of Finance and Development for Black Dance Stories. I'm also Black Dance Stories in the chat. So when you're chatting, you're chatting to me. So, you know, you can also say, hi, Renee, and post your questions and what have you, right? So that's me back there behind in the chat. I'm coming to you tonight from my home uh, that is housed on the stolen land of the Lenape people, uh, known today as Teaneck, New Jersey. As I acknowledge the Lenape people, I also want to honor my genetic and DNA lineage. I am the granddaughter of Eleanor, Louise Moore Jackson, and Charles Moore. I am the daughter of Eleanor Redding and Emmanuel Redding. I am the mother to Jasmine and Jennifer, my greatest teachers, and the grandmother to Dakota and wife to Jerry of more than 30 years. Thank you for joining us tonight for our 30th episode. Peace. And I pass it on to Gabe. Everybody, my name is Gabriel Lee Dekoladenu. I am an able-bodied Black man. I go by he, his, him. And I am also on the stolen land of the Lenape people. I am the son of William and Diane Dekoladenu. And I'm the brother to Elizabeth the Kohler Denner. And um, I do IT work as well as web development for um, Black Dance Stories. And I will pass it off to Makeda Smith. Hello, everyone. I'm so, so happy and so, so blessed to be here. Uh, my name is Makeda Imani Smith. I am the director of media uh, here for Black Dance Stories. I am the daughter of Jarrett and Allison Smith, the sister of T.R. Anderson Smith. I'm currently calling in from the stolen land of the Lenape people, currently known as Flatbush, Brooklyn, New York. I am a non-disabled Black woman. I currently have on a Black hoodie with a white Urban Bush Woman logo. Uh, big gold hoop earrings and a black and gold satin scarf wrapped around my natural hair. I'm currently sitting in a burnt orange and cream plaid chair, white wall with a mirror peeking down. And I will go ahead and pass it on to Antonio. All righty then. <laughs> I'm Antonio Burkett of Intentional Interpreting. Um, uh, BDS and I partner to provide accessibility in the form of ASL Interpreters Weekly. Um, thank you for that. I am a non-disabled Black male, and I'm right now in my home with a plain background, wearing a long sleeve Black Oxford shirt striped tie and white cardigan and i reside in the dc metro area um the unceded territories of the anacostan and piscataway people and with that i will pass it on to david thank you antonio um hello everyone i am david j roberts i am the executive director of 651 arts um, and on behalf of 651 Arts, we are so thrilled, blessed, and happy to be in communion and partnership in co-presenting this incredible series with Black Dance Stories. Um, we serve uh, 
the entirety of the diaspora um, through the performing arts. Um, and so we are just um, thrilled to be a part of this. I am zooming into you uh, from Manhattan, uh, the unceded and stolen lands of the Lenape people. And uh, behind me, um, we're in my living room. There is a grass cloth, uh, a blue and cream grass cloth behind me with a 15 year old plant. And uh, you'll see masks from uh, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, Brazil, and South Africa behind me. Uh, I am an able, uh, accessibility tech. I'm an able bodied black man. Uh, with a beard, bald. Um, I'm wearing a two-toned wool sweater and a colorful uh, scarf. Um, I am the grandson of David and Ruth and OJ and Velma. I am the son of Russell and Cheryl. I'm the brother of Wesley and Jamil, and I am the husband of Paul, uh, and yeah. I am the uncle to many. So, um, <laughs> With that, I will uh, pass it on to Denise. Thank you, David. I do have a question to ask. We skipped over Caitlin. Caitlin, but, but I, Caitlin, are you able to be seen? Yay! Thank you, Denise. Yes. You're welcome. <laughs> okay, I figured it out. Um, uh, there hey, was Caitlin. a small tech issue. Um, <laughs> Uh, my name is Caitlin Chandler. I'm the video tech for Black Dance Stories. I'm, non, I'm a non-disabled queer Black woman uh, living in the unceded territory of the Lenape people, now known as Brooklyn, New York. Uh, I have a room that has nothing behind me because I just moved, and I'm wearing a, a sweater. Yeah, okay. All right, now, now you go, Denise. Thank you, Caitlin. And she's an amazing tech person, I have to say. My name is Denise Saunders Thompson, and I'm the president and CEO of the International Association of Blacks in Dance. Every community owes its existence and vitality to generations from around the world who contributed their hopes, dreams, and energy to making the history that led to this moment right now. Mm -hmm. Some were brought here against their will. Some were drawn to leave their distant homes in hope of a better life. And some have lived on this land for more generations than can be counted. Okay. Truth and acknowledgement are critical to building mutual respect and connection across all barriers of heritage and difference. We begin this effort to acknowledge what has been buried by honoring the truth. We are standing on the ancestral lands of many Mm -hmm. We pay respects to the elders and people of this land, past and present. Okay. Please take a moment to consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that bring us here together today. And please join us in uncovering such truths at any and all public events. I am a Black woman. I stand in my home in Silver Spring, Maryland. I currently have on a black turtleneck shirt with big silver hoop earrings. I wear a curly natural haircut and I have gray streaks coming into my hair. <laughs> Behind me is a painting from Ghana. And I also have a giraffe and a hat on the wall as well. And I am so thankful to all of you for inviting me to be here today. And I celebrate Black dance stories every single day. Yes. Thank you so much. So community is such a big part of Black dance stories. And we want to know who's watching tonight. So mm -hmm. like this video drop comments in the chat, say hello, where you're watching from, and feel free to engage, engage, ask questions, share love. Um, please follow us on our social media. 
Our Instagram is at Black Dance Stories. Our Twitter is at BLK Dance Stories. Um, it should be in the description and also in the chat. Both of our Instagram and Twitter, oh, I just said that it should be in the, in the chat, the links in the chat. We have a huge goal of making it to 1,000 subscribers, so please subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't already. Um, we can't get to that 1,000 without your help, your community. We have a subscriber Sunday, so look out for that on our social media and in your email. Um, day where we are illuminating our amazing community and encouraging more people to be a part of, our, of it. Yeah, um, we wanna thank and so thank you for your continual love and support. And without further ado, grab yourself some wine, water, tea, cup of happy, and let's cheers to Black Dance Stories. Cheers. And I pass it to Kiman. Okay, just quickly, and then we'll get started. Um, we are looking for interns interested in joining our BDS team. And if you haven't already, please consider joining our mailing list. I just wanna say we will always stay vigilant. Our BDS team will continue to stand in solidarity with our sisters and brothers in Africa and all over the world with all those who want an immediate end to systemic racism. And with that, I turn it over to our fierce and ferocious leader. <laughs> dang. What? Wow, I got fierce and ferocious. <laughs> dang, come on now. Yes, everybody say yes, yes. <laughs> See you, Caitlin, dancing all the time. I love every one of you. You make me happy, I'm full and let's get going. Bye, Denise, see you soon, I know. See you soon, David, I know. Antonia, you're not going anywhere. Renee, kill that chat. Makeda, boom. Bye, Gabe, thank you. All right, Kimani and Maki are gonna be back soon, but guess what? It's time to bring in Diane Walker. Come on in, Diane. Bring the love, bring the world, Hey. Whoa. Oh, nice cheers. In the room. Cheers. Come on. <laughs> mm. Wait, did you take a sip? You can't oh, say oh, cheers oh, oh. on that day. Yeah, see? Mm. Absolutely. All right, Mama, introduce yourself. Oh, this is my your time. Goodness. Well, I was just taken by all the introductions I just heard. It is a pleasure an honor actually for me to be in this room with so many wonderful, fascinating people. So thank you off the top for the invitation. Um, I'd like to introduce myself. Um, my name is Diane Walker and I am the daughter of Helen Westmoreland, Philadelphia, father Arthur Taylor, South Carolina, and I am a non disabled black woman. I live in Boston, Massachusetts. I'm not sure uh, whose land this is. I'm gonna say Lenape because that sounds like that has been um, the, the name for, for tonight. So I'm gonna go with that because I'm gonna take a guess at that one. I'm not sure, I'm sure this land is stolen. Not sure uh, the details. I'll get back to you on that one. But I am the wife of Rodney Walker. We have been married 51 years and our greatest accomplishment are our two children, Michael and his wife, Helen of Charlotte, North Carolina, and my daughter, Michelle Walker, uh, currently of Fairfax, Virginia. Um, our greatest um, accomplishments are in our two grandchildren, Michael and Nicholas. Uh, who are finishing up college. Uh, Michael is in Chapel Hill, finishing dentistry. And uh, Nicholas has just graduated with a bac baccalaureate degree in an MBA program. Very proud of our, of our grandchildren. We also live with two dogs, two little Bichon dogs, Missy and Bailey. And they currently are the focus of our daily lives. Um, on Monday, I celebrate my 70th birthday. And uh, my husband and I have actually been married 51 of those 70 years. So that's 
amazing when I saw it myself written on paper. I am a tap dancer and as I said, I live in Boston. I'm in a room that is a little cluttered as you can see. It's my office and I'm trying to organize some things, but I'd like you to take a look at behind me. There's a, a picture, it's a Van Der Zee print. And because I'm a tap dancer, of course, this was very interesting to me. Here's a postcard picture of it. It's uh, five little girls tap dancing. It's a dance class from 1928. Um, I found the postcard many years ago. And then one late night while browsing the internet, I found that poster. Wasn't it very expensive, so I immediately bought it. Haven't hung it because I'm thinking of moving from this house. So it's in a temporary location. Um, let's see, I am wearing an Imagine Tap t-shirt. Let's stand up so I can show you this. It was from a show that Derek Grant, who I'm very fond of as a tap dancer, uh, created in Chicago. Very successful show. We hope that we see that again for any of you who haven't had a chance to see it. I, I really hope we can bring that one back. And I am wearing the jewelry of one of the producers of a show that I'm gonna talk with you about tonight, Black and Blue. She unfortunately passed away last week and um, I am, am still um, memorializing her in my heart and in my mind. So I'm wearing jewelry that she designed and gave to me uh, as a present. So my hair is in a ponytail. It has become completely gray, used to be black, but um, completely gray. And uh, that's about it. Again, I'm a tap dancer and I'm from Boston. Um, you you want to go straight to black and blue or you want more? You got well, more. I, I want, Charmaine, I had a question for you because, you know, yeah. I thought I can go a lot of different ways talking about tap dancing, especially to this audience who I feel I would really like to share some very specific uh, developments in, in our history. So I was just wondering before I got started, was there anything in particular um, that you had in mind when you invited me to be a part of this? Is there anything that you would like for me to address before I get started on a topic that I just chose? No. Okay. We just, right. This is your living room and we're just listening at your feet. Okay. All right, great. Okay, well, I wanted to, um, a lot of people don't really know about this resurgence in tap dance, when it started, how we got these fantastic dances that we have on the current scene. I think most of you know the dancers I'm referring to, the young dancers who are now the, the leaders in tap dance and in our community, dancers like Derek Grant, um, Michelle Dorrance, Jason Samuel Smith, Dormisha, um, to name a few, uh, Ayadeli Cassell, um, Sarah Reich. Yeah, there are, there are just many. We have a lot of dancers in the tap scene right now that we're really proud of, but I'm not sure that a lot of you understood how that all came to be. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that and then go into the history of a, of a show called Black and Blue, which some of you may have seen it. We, it was on Broadway in 1989, 90, and it closed in 91. But if you weren't on the scene at that time, perhaps you didn't really get a chance to see that show. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that. Um, you know, as a little girl, I took tap dancing as maybe a lot of you did. I went to dancing school and it was my life. Dancing school was my life. And my teacher was a woman named Mildred Kennedy in Boston, who was, I mean, it was black dancing school in the heart of our community and everyone was trained really well so this was a really good dancing school. I, I learned lessons by the time I was eight years old. I was doing professional work. I did um, Finian's Rainbow. I was on television in, in Bozo Show and other children's programs. So the training was, was excellent. And I, she had us professionally working in the 50s. The way I'm talking about 1953 to 60 was the period that I'm referring to. Great training. And I noticed in my dancing school, there were always what I called the gentlemen of the community that used to come in, hang out, and watch the, the kids dance. And often, you know, give you an, uh, an, a nod of approval or a look of, mm, and you knew what you had to do. 
And uh, that was sort of an everyday thing at my dancing school. Later, I grow up to learn that those people were some of the dancers from the professional uh, dance community who used to hang out, so to speak, um, because Boston was a mecca for jazz and dance. And um, so we had a lot of entertainers that came through town. And when they did, they often visited other performers. And Mildred Kennedy was a performer herself named the Brown Bomber as a tap dancer. That was her stage name. So when she retired from show business, she opened a dancing school and a lot of her friends came through there. Friends like Sammy Davis Jr. Um, people like that, that used to just stop in as a kid. So, I, so I've always kind of been exposed to people in show business. When I was a kid, I didn't quite understand why all the gentlemen in my community had uh, were dressed up. And it was only Tuesday. I couldn't understand as a kid why they had their Sunday clothes on and it was Tuesday. I later found out that most of the men that I was making that reference to were people that were involved in show business. So I was around this at a very young age, not even totally aware of the magnitude of my presence. But I danced and I enjoyed tap the most. It was just what I liked. Um, I uh, never ever thought that that would become my career. I did it because I loved it. I had polio actually as a kid. And my reasons for being put into dance class at such a young age were to strengthen my legs because I had polio. So uh, my mother was just happy that I enjoyed it and she continued. So we very abruptly left the Boston area. My mother remarried and I ended up uh, on an Air Force base in the desert in California, Edwards Air Force Base, where there was no tap dancing happening. I'm now about 11 years old, 12. And uh, from there, we moved out of the country, actually, to Okinawa, where I went to high school. Again, I was not dancing. Everyone in Okinawa was either doing ballet or uh, karate. I wasn't interested in either one. My, I didn't have the flexibility in my body as a result of the polio to really excel in ballet. Tap was really my forte. So uh, I didn't dance again until I was 28 years old. By then I'm married, I'm through school, I'm on my way to law school actually. And if I ever write that book, it's gonna be called On My Way to Law School, I Met a Tap Dancer. So I hear, I met a, an affair in the community with my in-laws. I was rather bored. Most of the people were quite older than I was at the time. I was 27 and um, at the end of the table sat this guy with these, Coke bottle glasses on and looking like he had just stepped out of vaudeville, but he was making rhythmic sounds with his feet under the table. And I heard that and moved closer to him because the rhythms really caught my ear. They were familial. I remembered those rhythms. So I got close to him, started to listen, and um, I started to move my feet around a little bit. And he laughed and he said, yeah. I said, yeah. So we get to talking. And uh, I told him that I had danced and I danced with Mildred Kennedy. Of course, he knew her and he told me to show him something. So I got up and I did my little time step that I remembered. And he said, that's good, sugar. And I said, but I never learned to do it like that, like he did. I really wanted to learn what, what he was doing. Um, the level, the sophistication of the rhythms that he could execute on that floor just blew my mind. And I really wanted to learn that. And I remembered how much I loved that the sound of that, how it made me feel. So he set me off on a journey the very next day. I go into the studio and I meet a man named Leon Collins. Leon was uh, just a fabulous, uh, an extraordinary tap dancer. He was out of Chicago originally, but ended up in Boston as many tap dancers did because Boston was often referred to as the graveyard for entertainers. The graveyard because while they traveled around perhaps on tour, once they got to Boston, they, there was so much work there that they stayed. So Boston came, became an end of the road for a lot of entertainers that were traveling around because that whole East Coast uh, was being managed out of Boston and thus work was um, you know, available for a, a lot of dancers. So a lot of uh, dancers, specifically tap dancers and jazz musicians ended up uh, in, doing lots of time in Boston. 
So that happened to Leon. He stayed there. He worked for many years uh, in the Boston area. But you know, Boston is also a very racist. I think Boston has a history of being a very racist city, um, state too. But um, he, uh, I think on the way to a gig, the story was traveling with a white woman in his car, stopped by the police, beaten so bad with those batons, beat his legs so bad, he didn't dance again for 13 years. And um, he was rather, uh, he, he was rather um, sullen really about tap dance. It didn't, it, he just had a hard time even considering going back into the business. But I think it was Tina Pratt, a friend of his, a co, worker because Tina was also a professional dancer and had a history in Boston, coaxed Leon out of retirement around 1975 or six. And I meet him in 77, 78, uh, but he's, so he's just come out of retirement at the coaxing of, of Tina and some of the other people like the man I met in the vaudeville outfit that night, his friend, Willie Spencer, um, Johnny Steppenstone, Buddy Lucas, there were several uh, dancers in Boston that came together under the direction of, of a woman named Tina Pratt and began to perform again. And that was around the time that I met them. So I decided I'm going to join this party because I really want to understand how to do this. So I come in at a time when tap dancing was experiencing a um, renaissance, so to speak because what was happening in Boston was happening in California and there was a small group maybe in, in Philadelphia. LaVon Robinson is back on the scene and he meets a younger uh, woman, Jermaine Ingram, like myself. She connects with uh, Jermaine, connects with LaVon. I connect with Leon. People, that's happening sort of all over the country and this is the mid to late 70s. And um, we get, a little, we get a presence going. I have to, at this point, interject that without the support of people like Sally Ann Kriegsman, who was from the National Endowment of the Arts, um, Marta Kern, um, and other uh, artistic art, arts organizations, without the help of those organizations, we would never have brought TAP back to the point that it is today. Fortunately, there were people around in those institutions who felt as strongly about tap dance as I did and as many other people did. And they laid a foundation upon which we began to grow. And they supported these men, these black men out of retirement to share their knowledge and their art with younger dancers at the time I was the younger dancer. I remember Honey Coles introducing me as the baby. Um, and, and so I have a, a, great, a, a great deal of gratitude that uh, I have to throw to the um, local arts councils as well as the National Endowment of the Arts because they really provided a foundation for us to, to grow. And through there, through that and through that support, we began to grow as an, as an organization. And the men that I'm referring to that were out of retirement, that were on the scene to teach younger dancers like myself included people like not only Leon Collins, who I had met, but Honey Coles, uh, Eddie Brown, the Nicholas brothers, the Step brothers, um, uh, Steve Condos, um, uh, Levon Robinson. Um, I could go could go on and on because these dancers then started to really come together, and our community began to grow. The problem for me was that there weren't a lot of black dancers, young black dancers, on this scene. So I, I wasn't seeing a tap dance community with black death. Now, I don't, when I say that, I don't mean to say that tap was not visible during that period because the period of the seventies that I'm talking about, of course we had Gregory Hines, it was back from California. He had lived for a long time on Venice beach, but he came back to New York and he was doing, you know, UB sophisticated ladies. Um, he had a presence on, and there was certainly um, a, a hint and battle in Greg Birch who were two of what of Broadway's finest dancers. So I don't mean to imply that black dancers were not tap dancing, but black dancers were not tap dancing in the lineage of these old masters of the art form. That was not happening. And that's where, that's the point at which I come in 
and get very interested in trying to right that wrong. That became a real issue for me. So I quit my job. At that point, I was working. I had a job, uh, paycheck, health insurance, uh, the whole nine, and decided I was going to quit my job. I was that serious about wanting to, to spread the word and get involved in uh, creating a visibility for tap dance, and especially a visibility in the Black community. So I quit the job. And, uh, and right away, we start to build what we now have as the tap dance community. Fortunately, at this, around that same time, a, a show was being put together that was going to open in Europe. And now I was definitely not looking for a professional dance career. I got into this, pulled my sleeves up because I love tap dancing. I was good at it and I could teach. And I really wanted to sort of get the ball rolling. But somebody called me from New York and asked me if I was, if I would come and meet a man named Henry Letang. Well, I wasn't really looking for a, for a gig, but I was curious and I did go to New York and met this man named Henry Letang. And to make a long story short, I was offered a position as a tap dancer in a, in a show that was gonna open in Paris. And the show was gonna run for 12 weeks. So I thought, oh, I can do this. 12 weeks, we worked it out. My, my son was in high school playing basketball. He stayed in Boston with my husband. My daughter was 14. She went with me. We went to Paris. We did the show, but that show was a big success in Paris. And a contract that was 12 weeks ended up being six or seven months. Mm. So uh, it was, it turned into something that I hadn't quite expected. But on the other hand, I really now have dug into tap dance. I have brushed all the dust off of my shoes and I'm in it for the long run. I love tap dancing. So uh, I came back from Paris and it took three years before that same show was Mount for Broadway. Uh, the name of that show was Black and Blue. Um, I'm not sure that a lot of you have seen it. So I wanna talk just a little bit about that show because uh, it certainly is part of the foundation that we stand on today. Most of the young tap dancers on the current scene Oh, a debt of gratitude to the people who put this all together because it really was the foundation and the glue that solidified a, uh, a permanence uh, in the future for tap dance. So these, um, the, the directors were from Argentina. Hector Arizoli and Claudio Segovia came to New York probably a few years prior to Black and Blue. They had come to New York with a show called Flamenco Porto. And they were foreigners to this country and they really couldn't find anyone who was interested in picking up uh, their show. They had a hard, hard time shopping Flamenco Porto. Not a lot of people were that interested in producing the show, but finally they find a producer. His name is Mel Howard. And Mel gets him into city center with, uh, with Flamenco Porto. And that show becomes a hit. Don't know if any of you are familiar with flamenco, but flamenco porto becomes a hit. And they come on the heels of that show, they come in with another one. They take that one off to Broadway. And then their next show was Tango Argentina. Very successful show. So now these directors are very successful. The producer uh, they're, they're working together. They've all become, they've become millionaires on these shows. They, it was very successful work for them. And one of the uh, biggest theaters in Paris, the Chatelet Theater, makes a request. They want them to bring a show to Paris, but they want a Black show. Paris specifically asks for a Black show. Uh, they put together Black and Blue. Um, as that show was sort of a... Uh, an extension of a black show that was running in New York. I'm gonna throw this out and ask if anyone has heard of it. And if you haven't, I want you to kind of look it up and see what you can find out about this show. But it was called A Thousand Years of Jazz. That show happened without a lot of, a lot of notice. A lot of people didn't see it. It was a fantastic show. 
um, the they put the age, how they came up with the name of the show is they put everybody's name ages together. And it was over a thousand years because they had the greatest jazz musicians and the greatest tap dancers. The line of hoofers in that show were Jimmy Slide, uh, Lon Chaney, uh, Raymond Kaland, um, Buster Brown. And there was a singer, I can't remember the singer's name off the top of my head, but there was a vocalist and musicians and a group of tap dancers. That show, kind of opened the door and led the way for everything that followed. Because when the Paris show, the Chatelet Theater asked for the black show, Mel Howard, who was the producer of that show, offered them a thousand years of jazz. But they didn't want that show. They wanted something bigger. This was Paris. They like a spectacular show. They wanted more fashion and, and more elegance and sophistication and presentation. And I feel like, Mm -hmm. You should go dot, dot, dot. Yeah. And have them, have our audience wait and wait and come back to Black and Blue in America. Because okay. now it's time to bring Gabri in. Okay. And I want to do some shout outs because y'all got friends here. Oh. Y'all got friends watching. Okay, come on in, Gabri. Vincent Thomas is here. Oh. Elizabeth Zimmer is here, Kyle Marshall, Trebian Pollard, Anna Gori, Ariana is here, Christopher Williams is here, and Ann Davison is here, Sandra Burton, Janet Wong, and of course, Hank Smith is here. And Hank is like, hey, hey, I see you out there. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to wait first. Welcome, Gabri. Cheers. Cheers. Hi, Gabri. I don't see her. Hi, I'm here. Oh, there you are. Hi, Gabri. I'm going to leave you two beautifuls for a little bit, and then I'll come back. But to be continued with you, Miss Diane, and they're going to be waiting because you know they want to know. All right. right. Know, right? Have fun and try, know. <laughs> try to behave yourselves. Yes. Diana was so great. And I have to admit, I don't know that much about tap. Um, mine is that I'm a big admirer. I can't tap to save my life. <laughs> I will tell you, I love, you know, love, love, love tap. And I just gave up on it. Um, I did recently see the documentary, Bring Them Back by Maurice Hines. About oh, my yes. Yeah. So good. Um, yeah. And I was so happy that the documentary was made and it also told me so much a little bit about that history and I know you know Maurice and you knew Gregory right you danced with yeah. them oh, and, yeah. and, and I'm a Paisian sister so yay Pisces uh -huh. <laughs> yes yay March babies we are uh, in the Pisces season right now yes definitely so I yeah. was really curious I mean um well, that's why I'm so excited to be involved in this. Black Dance Stories brings tap dance. And I think there's there's a little less known about tap dance because, you know, when you think of, of the history of, of Black dance history in, in the country, tap dance is, is we're, we're coming up on that history. I don't think that we're, our stories are as well known as some of the others. That's why it's important for me to try to give a background so that folks understand where we are today and how we got there and why it's so important for us to have the visibility of the dancers that we see today. Like I, if I just jumped ahead in this story, I could go on and on with how we got to where we are. Right. But right now I'm celebrating uh, organizations like the Joyce Theater who has really, Aaron Maddox has just uh, said very straightforward that he really enjoys tap dancing and he feels like the, the playing field hasn't been level. He, he didn't use those words, but he, he sort of vowed to, to bring tap dance to contribute to the form as much as he can. And he's done a fantastic job with bringing some of the artists that he brought in, particularly last year, we had such a strong presence of tap dancers at yeah. the Joyce Theater. I was thrilled. And this year it's been announced a uh, Ayodele Casella is coming back with a show and I'm just really excited. I could go on and on just talking about that, but I want to ask you a question. Black dance. I mean, it is black dance, right? Because I, yeah. I, I happen to teach dance and film and sort of history of film and history of film, it all starts with all the dances, like pretty mm -hmm. much were uh, tap dancing. Can and you tell me about the doll? I am so intrigued by the doll 
um, and your stories of the doll and how you saw that in that in that little doll. I collect dolls. And oh, the doll. I oh. saw the doll that you make reference to and you go into such a reflection, the depth of things with your mom and, and your whole experience. It just really took me. So could you just tell me a little bit more about oh, the doll you. and how that I, came I, to you? Yeah, I should have the doll. I should, you know, when we go, I should just, in the end, I'll bring it out. Yeah, it is, that doll is part of a story. I did a one woman show, which I was supposed to tour all last year and I was supposed to go to South Africa, which I was very excited about. Um, but that doll was my mom's doll and it's a little black doll. Mm -hmm. And my mom is a white lady. Mm -hmm. And I just really was fascinated by the doll and how possibly this doll had really changed her life. Mm -hmm. Because I never understood how this little black doll from, you know, landed in my mom's. Because she was in the Netherlands, right? In the Netherlands in the 40s and, you know, starting World War II. And she got this little black doll from, um, turns out, from her sister um, who was dating this sea, sea man. Mm -hmm. And he gave it to her. And she always really loved that doll. And I always really loved that doll. And... Um, you know, I, my, my theory is that black doll was why she married my dad. She had this whole history about it. But it's a little porcelain black doll. Well, I loved how you took that and how that went, you went very, you went inside and you found um, some real magical uh, aspects of, of your relationship with your mom. I, the process by which you used the doll to create the work fascinated me I just wanted to share that with you and um and since I've read that because I only came in contact with that a few weeks ago I think after Charmaine and I had talked and I started to look I was just I want you to know that I was so fascinated with that it has made me stop and look at aspects or things in my life that I never expected to find the depth of my being in some inanimate objects that I have in my in my sphere. Um, yeah. So I mean, thank you for that because you've oh, sent me on a journey uh, and it's been fascinating for me. We can talk at another time just how that opened up uh, some aspects of my life that were fascinating. So I'm, I'm thanking you for that. Know about that. You know, even the, the, the stories behind every tap shoe you have. And mm -hmm. because, you know, things are things, but things also are have meaning because people give them to us and they travel, you know, where you got them. Um, like I today I'm wearing this little blue cross mm -hmm. and can you see it and okay. yeah and this was also a thing of my mom and she is was placed in a home and I found it I still don't know where she got it from but there's this these little things that have so much meaning attached to them because we we have we have them right we mm -hmm. people that we know the people are attached to it like the thing is people are attached to the things that we have mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. they can bring us to a journey so yeah i think for me a lot of it is about the stories behind it and i think like when i hear you speak what's so beautiful is how you were led to tap and how you led to tap dancing but then also how the connections, like how Paris, like, you know, just how yeah. we and then Also, you know, I was really curious to talk about motherhood with you. Mm -hmm. um, your grandmother, I'm not yet. <laughs> minute. But um, how did you do that? How did you, did you think about that? Because I was like, okay, so she took her daughter, I recognize that part, take the daughter with you, right? Yeah. Um, and you go, but then, you started this whole career and your kids were still there. So how, how was that for yeah, you? That was, that was difficult. I don't think I could have done it if I didn't have the support of my husband who just looked at me. And I think he saw how much joy there was from, from that. It, it changed me in that sense. And that was probably for the better. Mm -hmm. um, so he supported it because I loved it so much. He he dibbled and dabbled in tap dance. Um, he got involved with the people. So fortunately, 
the tap dance community has wonderful people associated with it. And he, it was very easy for him to become friends with all the players in the game. And they like to play golf and they like to do other things. So he found his way with friendships uh, in the tap dance community. My kids, neither one of them uh, dance professionally, but they did when they were younger. And uh, I think they got uh, a lot from that, the, the experience. I mean, my daughter was so angry that she had to go to Paris with me at 14. <laughs> I had to go to Paris with my mother. Um, but I only hope that someday she would come back to me and say, you know, my that was really a good thing to do. And she did. She was about 26, 27 years old before I finally got a, that was a pretty good thing to do. Um, she moaned and groaned about it until then. But it, it was, uh, it did offer some really interesting experiences. And then, of course, my son came over, so they got to travel. So they, everybody got a little something, you know, there was something to balance out was sort of what we were doing. And then once my kids were in college and, and gone, Ronnie and I found a balance. We found a way to, to make this work in our relationship. So the times that I was away, um, when I came home, we knew that, you know, we had X amount of, I'm home for 10 days before I'm gone again. So we made the best of those 10 days. There was no, you know, foolishness. And it just really helped us. It created a structure for us that really became positive in, in our relationship. And we've managed to stay together. I mean, it's 51 years. And we're still uh, trying to figure it out, but you know uh, it works. That's amazing. And are you? Because um, you're still teaching, right? Oh yeah, I'm still teaching. I'm still performing somewhat. I I, uh, I have had some medical setbacks, so I don't perform as much as I used to. But um, but I can still uh, you know take a swing when I need to. Um, so, but I do still do uh, a lot of teaching and, and traveling. Um, I don't see myself retiring quite yet. There's okay. still a lot more work to do. Oh yeah, what, what is retiring? I always wonder about that. And like, you know, I'm thinking, okay, I wanna be making work. Yeah. For me, that's brought till, till like literally I can't, right? But mm -hmm. it, I, it's hard for me to think about creating right now because I need to, I need to gather an archive. I, I really need to pull together some of the history that is important for me to make sure that certain things are documented and archived uh, appropriately. And so I've got some some work to do. We're going to make a call out to do that. I think yeah. this is your moment to say you need help archiving. <laughs> oh, yeah. I've been saying that. You can't, you can't be doing that all alone. Yeah. Know? Yeah, I've had some, I did, I did get some responses and I have some people that have reached out to help me and that's great because like you said, it's overwhelming. I didn't prepare for it. So to any of the young dancers that are listening, prepare for your archives. Always be thinking ahead and, and getting, keeping things organized and having things um, make it, it makes it a lot easier when you go to try to put it together. Maybe I didn't realize how important Because when you're working, you don't have time. I mean, I have a yeah. bunch Stuff. and then recently I was like I need to put it together and have them all in a big drawer and and then like even even photocopying them and then making it a pdf and then <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's overwhelming I, and that that's why I'm in this office I'm trying my best to pull things together and I do want to write uh, I am going to get a book written but I'm working on it there's yeah. so much to do I can't wait. I can't wait. And I, I, I just think it's, it's amazing. And I was really curious to know, what do you think about newer, um, younger students? Do they, have they changed? Like what? what I am so, I, I sort of was the intermediary between the older guys and mm -hmm. the younger, because I was that middle person. Mm -hmm. So Savion, Derek, Domitia, all the kids call me Aunt Diane, mm -hmm. um, and, because I, I was that in, pulling them together it was very important to develop a, a young generation of dancers, specifically black dancers. Um, and, I, and, and so that has been done so successfully now. Yeah. I'm so excited about that. I could just scream from the- well, You should scream. And women, and yeah. women. And women. Yeah, yeah. 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 I, I'm just right. so happy. I, will, I am the biggest cheerleader they will ever have. Those are my kids, you know, those are my oh. kids. And Aww. they are killing. And um, 
there's some more folks here and they keep coming, which is so great. And questions are coming in. Flav Flavia Costa and Stephanie Tuman. So oh. More people are here. All right. This Can I is shout where... back to Sandra Burton? I heard you mention Sandra Burton and I love her so much. And she's been so helpful, Sandra and her students. I mean, she had her students at Williams actually help me with a project uh, back when I was doing some work between Jacob's Pillow and, and Williams College. She's been a very much a part of my whole trajectory. And I, I owe a great debt of gratitude oh. to Sandra. And I'm so happy that she's here. I love you, Sandra. Oh, talk about community, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, don't go too far, Diane. Don't go mm -hmm. too far. But Gabri's gonna tell her story. And when we come back, we've got you to finish your story, right? So okay. see you in a little bit. <laughs> okay. All right. How you getting, Gabri? Cheers one more time. Hi, cheers. Cheers of my tea, James Baldwin. Cheers. Somebody, somebody gave a shout out to your Baldwin mug. I'm just saying. Oh, yeah. You know, and these days it's like Baldwin and my Black Lives Matter cup. <laughs> so. Um, Welcome, Gabri. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for having me. I'm so grateful. Oh, and, we are grateful to have you introduce yourself and, and yes. we're here. We're all ears. Okay. So yes, I'm Gabri Krista. I'm a black dancer, filmmaker, um, wearing yellow, curly, dark brown hair. I'm standing in front of a Haitian painting of a voodoo ritual that I love in front of an um, orange wall. I am coming to you from Staten Island, New York, land of the Lenape Hockey, stolen land. I live here with my husband, musician Vernon Reed, and our daughter, Idea Reed, and our two cats, and one is trying to come into the room. <laughs> so I keep on like blocking the door. Um, I am from Curaçao, Dutch Caribbean, fellow Caribbean immigrant to this country. Um, I'm the daughter of Marcel Herman Ludwig Stomp and Josefina Magdalena Aleida de Jong. Um, granddaughter of Heloise Ongasui, Gertrude Levy, and many more. We are involved in this long project with my family, getting the whole tree figured out and we are far <laughs> we are far um yeah i i loved hearing the story of diane and it reminds us me of how all our stories are so different and how we come to dance is so interesting and there's no real linear way i come to dance through yoga i started yoga at an age nine um I had a beautiful black man leo florida who so was my teacher my dad brought me to yoga because i had a heart issue and i stayed i started teaching yoga at 14 and um i'm a maker i i still um i'm a dancer but i always say i'm a maker because whatever the story is is what i will use so i used to write poetry i wrote and I started, I did some film stuff with my two other mentors all back home. And I really want to call out the people that are so important for me and that, you know, you'd never get to where you are alone. And that saw something in me, right? And so the first people, um, besides my yoga teacher, and I made a documentary about him in 2016, which is on Quelly TV, Quelly TV, African Global Diaspora Films subscribe, watch Carmen's film is in there. There's a lot of great stuff on there. Um, but yeah, started teaching yoga at 14 to kids. And then met Felix de Roy and Norman de Palm, two beautiful black men on my island who were filmmakers. And I started in their films. They pub I published my first story because they encouraged me to write my story that got published, et cetera, et cetera. And I did my first solo dance without any dance training, minus our local dances, um, at the opening of an exposition in Curacao of Norman, of his art, 
And those were mostly yoga poses. That was my dance. Um, <laughs> and people did take me down. They were like, what are you doing? Um, but it led to me when I went to the Netherlands, because we're colonies, we're st now a sort of a nation, but we still are colonies. And so when I went to the Netherlands and this was put all the scholarship kids on one plane and we ship us all up to the Netherlands and there, you know, we go and study to the, to the big motherland. Um, a woman named Dolly Beckers came to me, gave me a piece of paper and she says, you are a modern dancer. And I did not know what it was. I was going to go and study journalism and but i took it and i went to the person that she told me to go to and i started while i was enrolled in journalism this is paloma mcgregor and i have this journalism dance background together um and i discovered dance dropped out went to the school for new dance development and was super happy for us just to be dancing and um, never thought that that would be something I could do as a profession. Um, but in the Netherlands is sort of my conscious started happening because even though I'm a Dutch, had Dutch is my first language, my mom is Dutch, my father is from Suriname, people in Suriname speak Dutch, in Curaçao we speak Papiamento, but at home I spoke Dutch because of my parents and um, the Netherlands has this, when you're from the colonies, especially Curaçao, they sort of look down, you kind of don't belong and they have a separate category for you. And that was weird and painful for me. And so my whole identity, search for identity started happening there as a black Dutch person, not feeling like I belonged in the Netherlands. And so I made my first evening length piece, which was a real statement about sort of the second class citizenship I felt as a black Dutch person. And I sent Caitlin <laughs> this picture of this piece um, to um, Caitlin, um, if you can pull it up. I recently, um, while doing, um, while sort of thinking about today, I was thinking about um, what all led to the work and, and also thinking that I might be so that I have kind of a theme in a lot of the work and I think people can see it right so that's the poster of the piece yes we did dance pretty much new besides a g-string with mud and there was music and poetry I wrote poems and life and the piece really spoke about us all of us born black Dutch people and our status as second class citizens. And it led me, and you can take a picture away, <laughs> our naked butts. Um, but it led me to, um, it was very successful actually. Um, although the, the discussion about black dance in the Netherlands didn't really go anywhere at the time. And it's only now starting, which is 30 years later. <laughs> which is crazy, um, but I'm happy they're having it, and which is incredible. But it led me to go to Cuba um, on a scholarship, just like three three months and um, after we toured, and I just fell in love with Cuban dance. And Charmaine, you were there that the company I danced with was in the Joyce Theater, and it was a really emotional moment for me. So I got, went to Cuba and I decided I wanted to stay I auditioned, they didn't take any foreign dancers, but in exchange, I was teaching at the Instituto Superior de Arte and I uh, choreographed for the Danza Contemporanea de Cuba and danced with them, I still as the only foreigner, um, and helped found Danza Abierta de Cuba, which is the company uh, Marianela Boan started and I helped her with. Um, and yeah then went quickly back to the Netherlands after that and could not could not do it I couldn't do the Netherlands at the time I just felt um coming from Cuba dancing on that level dancing the pieces like you saw some of that and then having to be in this 
you know, they have a whole system like a, like that I had to be in a certain small theater because the other theater was, you know, it was an allochton. It's a whole story, but it's definitely sort of a segregated way of dealing with it. Um, and I just, I just couldn't. I basically just left. <laughs> I left. Ended up in Puerto Rico because I was invited to do something in Puerto Rico to a Cuban connection. Actually, friends I met in in, in Cuba and um, and stayed there, and that sort of led me to being here. Because of course, the single through line is that I'm always making work. That's the thing that leads me. I'm always creating, right? Always on that path. And I made work. Miriam Soto was there. And Miriam Soto said, I love your work. Give me, we had videotape, VHS back then. Give me a tape of your work. I'll take it to New York. And she did. She took it to David White. And um, I came with my piece, Matutina, which was a piece inspired by the book of one of my other mentors, deep thinkers, Maris Condé from Guadeloupe. Um, Music was done by Soraya at Santiago. It's always original music, always text in it. Um, Soil my sonet, Soraya Santiago, myself did this evening length piece at DTW and out of towner series. Remember, we had the out of towners back then. And yeah, kind of one thing led to the other. And um, Puerto Rico was hard. It's harder than New York. I didn't want to go back to New York, to the Netherlands. And I said, what on earth am I going to do? Um, let me go think in New York. That sounds really weird for New York. You know, like I had some connections from Puerto Rico and I came here and um, I stayed. I stayed because I got an apartment right away through another Dutch friend, uh, John Leerdam. I got my first place um, through a friend of his and stayed again and I got into Bill T joints pretty quickly after that actually um, and left also I didn't stay too long with Bill like maybe um, two and a half years I did original still here and um, left yeah I'm a maker so just ju just being the dancer was not my thing and um, yeah and then one thing led to the other <laughs> And there I met my husband, so, you know, the rest is history. And he's a pretty good guy, 21 years of marriage, 20, you know, so I stayed, I stayed. And yeah, so that is sort of the, how I, this is my, how I came to America story. <laughs> but by the time I got here, I had done already so much work because I made a lot of work in the Netherlands, evening leg work, big works, made a lot of work in, in Cuba too. Um, I was thinking about Diane. I have all the original things from Havana, my reviews, um, programs from that time. I even have my official document from the Ministry of Culture because somebody said like, they didn't believe I, I, I worked in Cuba and I was paid. And I said, I have this document. And you know, Charmaine, what the document was is that, you know, I'm a cat lady. Um, I found this cat in Cuba thrown out on the on the street i took it up i lived on uh, near the malacon and they threw this little kitten out of the car uh, the car and i took the cat and fed that illegal lobster because that was about the only thing i could find for the for the cat and i took the cat with me back out of cuba when i left and so we were like talking 90 something like that and um i went to the ministry of culture and i said you know i'm a better than anybody i need to take my cat which was a whole thing but who would take the cat <laughs> but he he said he said she's been a better worker than any worker she did this she did that we are going to give her this cat to take so they put the cat got the injections, went in quarantine, and I took my cat out of Cuba. And I have that letter saying, I work for the Cuban government, for the Dutch ministry, and please let this woman go, let this mulata go out with her cat. So, yeah, um, 
and I recently found that letter, which has been pretty fun to to uh, to have. Yeah, and and then you know, I think the main thing about me is that it's stories or the things I want to say, and a lot of it is really related to colonialism um, and effects of slavery. I think that frames everything, sort of uh, the 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 going back and forth, the mixing and matching. Um, that happened um, as somebody who is from the colony and um, going to sort of the mainland. I have to say, this country is with all the incredible difficulties, it's home. New York has been so amazing. This dance community has been really welcoming as even though I'm not from here, I always feel like I've been really welcomed here and I'm really grateful for that and the beautiful people and when I was making work and starting to look for guidance I found the guidance in you know the Maris Condé in Audre Lorde and those were the people I was reading uh, Angela Davis those were my those were my people that's what I read I have them all, all those books in Dutch <laughs> right now right so the the amazing black women that yeah who who really really set the way and set the tone for me um in my development and the amazing black caribbean women as somebody like maris conde who actually last year got the uh what was it the nobel peace prize when they're the nobel prize for literature when they're just all fighting about it so it's the alternative nobel prize but um, she is an amazing thinking thinker around what it means to be for the Caribbean diaspora um, and what we have in common as people. So, yeah, and then, you know, one day I just felt that um, I think having a kid had a lot to do with it. Um, I made uh, Domina, um, Dominata, which was the last piece I did at then still DTW, I think my fifth evening length piece very successful piece um, around Domino in New York. And it was just so hard. I mean, I was paying more to my babysit than I could pay my dancers, you know. And I said, you know, I just had started making films. And so that became much more of my focus of making, telling stories through film. But as you know, I also still, you know, you saw my piece about my mom. So it's, it's both, like it's kind of just, I make what feels that like feels best serves the story I want to tell. And definitely I'm a storyteller. That's for sure. Yeah. Excuse me. That was too quick about the film. Can you, can you just give a little, seriously? Come on. Yes. So that is because I was black dance, but yeah. So, um, I pride, I'm primarily, I'm a filmmaker, a dance filmmaker right now. I made, um three films my first let me i made three films in the african diaspora i made about i have about uh 12 films right now 12. um including um produced a feature film and i really started making films first social narrative films called the breach that um, were produced by um, Warrington Hopling, executive producer of the Black Filmmakers Foundation. He said, yeah, go ahead and do it. And I did it. I didn't really know what I was doing at the time at all. And then um, had, I had a lot of black men helping me along the way. So, you know, that's why I never understand what's the thing with black men, right? It's like, I, this, I know the most amazing black men including my dad, right? Can we just say that? Like, what's this about? Like, really? Um, he really was, helped me um, as executive producer for my three films. And then after that, I really wanted to know more about film. And I have Charles Stone, who did Drumline. He sort of mentored me in like how to up the game. And then make Quarantine with Carl Abraham. And it's a series of films called Another Building that plays narrative in and around sites that have to do with um the dutch african diaspora and and the um and slavery but it's a contemporary just reaction to that past and the beauties saying the beauty of the buildings and the sites that held horrific stories right 
um, those I have two now on my website that you can just see and the rest still has to be uploaded and I just made a film next week I have one in screen dance as a jury award which is in a short story I shot as in sin as a shot and wrote with um, Tan Dumlet who is dancing in it and it's about the mother worrying about her black son and that I did that in response to all the things that happened last year and all the time just like being a mother of a black son in this sense um yeah and i teach screen dance too and it's been really the thing that um that i've been very grateful to be developing and learning and now i'm trying to do a feature film of course you are <laughs> I've been writing grants, getting the money. And if I don't get the grants, I pick up the camera like I did and I'm going to shoot this thing myself. So there oh. we go. So there we go. Oh, come on back, Diane. Wow. Thank you both for stories. Thank you. Black Dan Stories will forever be grateful for all of you who, who share. This is when I search the chat to find questions. And actually, there are some. And while I search, maybe Diane, you can finish up the black, the, the black, wait, black and blue story. And I was there. Oh, I yeah, you I saw that? My, my mom, I took my mom mm -hmm. oh, so long yeah. ago. Yeah, I realized once I got started that I was taking the long way around to tell that story. I would take the, the way I was going, it pro I'd probably need two weeks to finish, to finish it. <laughs> But but I wanted to have a chance to sum it up because yeah. Black and Blue in Paris was the precursor to the Black and Blue Broadway show. But what we developed in, in Paris was really the foundation upon which we all stand in the tap dance community today. Mm -hmm. Because we knew that we needed a child and a child shall lead them, as has always been what, what we understand to be so. And the child that emerged from Black and Blue in Paris was a young kid named Savion Glover. And, and I can't, yes. I'm glad I had a chance to finish that part of the story to talk about how Savion yeah. then became the poster child for this dance form. And he, and he did that because he was, he loved it. He really loved dance. He had been primed for it. He came from a very um, a distinguished musical family. So he came with, a, a, with gifts uh, yeah. already, rhythmic and musical gifts. And everyone really uh, wrapped their arms around this young boy who really, really loved the dance. So he became the poster child for the dance. We came back, he had an experience that no other kid in the world had. Mm -hmm. And he was able to bring that back to the States and then once again, perform on the stage of, uh, of the Broadway stage and in the same show. So when I say that, people will say, well, you know, Savion did Tap Dance Kid before he did that show. But I'm, I'm talking about a very different style of tap yeah. dance and that's a whole nother conversation, but it is carrying on the legacy of the great masters of the art form is very different than some of the Broadway musical theater style choreography that tap dance had become over a period of time. It's like the two completely different genres. And so we're talking about preserving the art form in the style and the legacy of the masters of the, of the originators of the form. We went back to the originators of tap dance and we tried to bring that history forward. And that's the distinguishing factor between that style um, and that style. Now I get in trouble sometimes when I say style because they say, well, it's not tap dance is tap dance, it's not about style, it's about tap dance. But I use that to just yeah. really it, it, keep it clear so that people understand what I'm talking about. So from and the there, tap community right, and the beginning is known of, for this. Yeah, I'm very proud of, of the tap dance community. I feel, and I'm just gonna take the credit because I think that <laughs> I'm gonna take this credit for myself because I think that I came into it with that mentality. I came yeah. from a social work, psychology background, working in the community, that's all I knew. I grew up in the projects. I know all about community, that was my life. My mm -hmm. life was a, a life of community. 
And mm. so that's what I brought to this. And it was important to develop, to get the information, to understand the history, to bring the, 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 our elders to the front so that they got that recognition and understanding from other people. So they understood us. And Come we, on. We've done that. And when I look at Savion and then I look at all the other kids at the same time I was training Derek, Derek Grant and Dormisha, they were little kids, you know, um, Dulé Hill, don't, don't sleep on Dulé because he's the right. Dad. We all know him as an, as an, an actor and he's a fabulous actor. But he's the tap dancer, and he will cut you if you the tap dancer. Cut you, cut you. He's a I have a community dancer. question that came in from Sandra for Gabri. Speaking of community, and mm -hmm. she's asking which, the same thing that Diane is talking about: keeping connected. And are you connected? Thank you, Miss Sandra, Doctor Sandra. <laughs> keeping connected with the community in the Caribbean. Yeah. Are you? Yes, definitely. So thank you for that question. Uh, I am. I normally go back uh, at least every year. I'm in, con in close contact with Cuba. I've been going back. Um, I started years ago um, a Caribbean performing network that sort of I couldn't keep it up. But uh, our sister Candice is doing a lot of great work around the Caribbean dance community here mm -hmm. and also there. Um, my films, my first three films are all done in the Caribbean with people from there. Um, and I work, yeah, so I film with people there myself. Um, my film Casita is also on Quali TV. And I keep on saying Quali TV because it's a black woman who started it. It's fabulous people. And also there is, there is an, um, this film is a Papiamento and I already have 200,000 views on this platform that is all about black films so yay um yay. and then hopefully my other film will be there too so i i do go back and i try to do exchange and support the filmmakers there as well so yes wow you all have a lot of work well we we all have a lot of work to continue to do and miss diane Yes, Kimani has something to share with you. Oh. Hi, Kimani. I You're like muted, Kimani. Always forget. Always forget. I know. Hi, Diane. I just want to make sure that you know your land acknowledgement so oh, that you know it, is, it is not the Lenape, although I'm sure there are many indigenous nations that have traveled through, but the Wampanoag. Oh, yeah. Wampanoag Nimpok peoples. Wampanoag Nimpok? Yes, and, and I will send it to you and there's a link that you have. And you see, I'm very familiar with Wampanoags because I have family that, it, you know, if, if I don't want to really dig. I know the Wampanoag community in Mashpee. I knew they were down the Cape, but I wasn't sure if that extended as far as Boston. So thank you for that information. You're welcome. Oh my, community. Yes. Right? That's amazing. Yes. yes, that's very, very helpful information. Thank you very much. And we are in Black Dance Stories, we are continuing to learn about land acknowledgement. So we're throwing it all in the basket. And like Denise said at the beginning, there are many of us that have been displaced and many of us that came before us. And we just, we have to acknowledge that. We have yeah. to. I've got to learn how to say it correctly, Kimani, because I say Wampanoags, the Wampanoags, and I'm sure that's not how you say it, but. Um, you know, I think when I think of my brothers and sisters, the Cape Verdeans that are down in Mashpee, I think of the Wampanoags, but I have to learn to say that, you know, with a little more sophistication. So I'm going to get be in touch with you to get the correct um, enunciation. We're all learning. This is, you know, it's it's 728. No. Oh, wow. Yes. Oh, yes. I <laughs> I, that happened. That happened really fast. Yeah. Mm -hmm fast yes well at least you didn't get any phone calls from people telling you that uh, that i can't do this in a short period of time i just did something with some people in london for a, for a situation and the woman told me that people called her and actually said to her diane will never do that in an hour you know people called her and told her that Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. They threatened her. Come on. And you yeah. did. And there are more stories to be told. And that was oh, just the beginning story. And I yeah. love that. And I, I personally want to know more. So, oh, 
Yeah. So, and every every time I hear it myself, even it, it brings up a whole, I, I open up a whole nother uh, Pandora's box to go in a different direction in search of, I have so many questions. I mean, I talk, but I have questions. I'm still trying to, I'm still trying to figure this all out. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess I'll never stop doing that. I'll always I have questions. Going, right? always I, I, I have me. questions about everything, anything I want to learn, new things you want to learn in, in the form. Yeah. My favorite things to teach, I teach, a, I teach screen dance, but I also teach a dance in film course. And it really allows me to look into American dance, right? Mm -hmm. um, even though a lot of it was, of course, appropriated, but then you see when it comes, where it comes and how it has shaped dance right now, right? And then the part I had is like, why did it disappear? It's like the part mm -hmm. I what, happened? what was the quote from last week when I stop? If I stop learning, I can't teach. Oh my gosh, I can't believe I don't remember it. But yeah, but we can't I, stop. Right. Yeah. Right. Yes. When you stop learning, you, you if you stop learning, then you yeah. I forgot it too about. You stop learning if you're not curious. For me, it's like you gotta stay curious and learn and learn from each other and look at the history, learn from the history of of this country because it's rich what happens when you know even tapas is interesting history with with oh I yeah know, mm -hmm. the like how jazz music started um so no go we're not gonna on on. it's invention after invention after invention of um people coming together and making amazing art out of horrible circumstances me. So the answer is no, Diane. You're never going to stop <laughs> asking questions. And we're never no, going to stop I, asking you questions. I never think of myself as teaching. I think of it as sharing. I, I walk oh. into a room and I look at the room. Yes. I'll make an assessment in the first few minutes as to yes. who they are and what they're about, yes. what they need. And yes. then I reach into my pockets and see what do I have oh. that I can share with them that will help them move forward in their in their in, in their quest for, for dance, in their search. So I think of myself as, as sharing when I walk into a room. I, I never think of myself as teaching. Maybe I should, I should take that position straight no, up. No, we're by sharing. I say I teach, but I facilitate. Facilitate, yeah. yeah. I'm the yeah. facilitator of discussion or of dancing. It's not about me, it's about them, you know? So. Yeah. Jimmy uh, Slide used to say he didn't teach, he nudges. He said <laughs> nudge. Not just good. Not, not just, just good. good. Well, yeah. tonight was all about you too, for sure. So cheers to you too. Yeah. And I'm going to pass it to Makita. <laughs> Thank mm. you. Wait, I made a mistake. Sorry, Maki. Anything okay. coming up, Gabri and Diane, that we should know about? Films. Next week, there is a um, film in Screen Dance. My film, Son, is in Screen Dance. Scotland as international jury awardee and it I just posted it on my site and your website is just my name.com gabrichrista.com Miss yeah. Diane anything coming up off the top of my head I can think of uh, Allie Bradley and her husband Sean Jones are doing a fantastic showcasing with a Dizzy's uh something I'm not really sure off the top of my head what the title is but that's coming up at the end of the month i know that dormisha's um uh a presentation at um i don't know whether it was fall for dance is something oh, the joys the joys her derek joys. and no i thought it was the joys presentation but it was something she did solo and it's oh. been rerun for for us to see which was fabulous um yes. so there's fall for lots dance. of tap happenings right now that are that are coming up. I think everyone in the dance community is taking advantage of the fact that it is what it is. So we're really I'm... using the technology to share a lot of information that otherwise would not have been seen. So in the beginning, I was a little rah, 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 and now I really enjoy looking around and seeing all the things that are possible. I spend a lot of time watching and reading. That's how I got to know the story of the dance of the doll. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, oh. And, and then I saw Bill T. Jones, because in preparation for this, I was kind of looking around to see hey, what, how are these black stories like that? And I found Bill T. Jones talking in black dance stories. And I remembered the time that 
I, he was at Harvard and I went to see him. It was raining and it was full. And, and I, I was teaching at Harvard. I had connections to Harvard and I could have gotten in the door. I could have gotten in. Uh -huh. All I had to do was knock on that door and somebody would have let me in to see him. But there were so many people outside that couldn't get in, that it was too full. And the people that were outside, we all had tears in our eyes uh -huh. that we couldn't get inside to hear Bill. And somehow I couldn't pull rank that night. I just couldn't do it. I looked at all the other people that couldn't get in and I just didn't feel like I could pull the rank to, to walk in when, when we were the ones who didn't have a ticket and couldn't get in. So I stood there like everybody else crying because I couldn't get in to hear Bill speak at at uh at harvard but i got a chance to see him uh in black dance stories and it just made me so happy just to hear him yes! just to be in his presence and listen to him so i thank you for that oh i thank you again both of you for tonight cheers 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 now i'll pass it to you Makita. thank you <laughs> um thank you so to all the BDS family that's watching, a reminder to like, comment on this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on social media so we can grow and grow this community. Next week's artists are Giselle Mason and Jamal Story. So oh, see you Jamal. Thursday evening and we'll see you next week. Yes, indeed. And please uh -huh. drop a dime. Uh -huh. We'll take it all. We will take it all. And everybody going out there and get into some good trouble. trouble. Yes. <laughs> Cheers. Thank good you night. so much. Good night. Good night, Gabriel. Good night. Good night.